scripture reading today be taken from Matthew 19, verses 13 and 14. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should pull his hands on them, put his hands on them, and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such in the kingdom of heaven. Good morning. It is beautiful this morning. Uh, hey, I don't know if you guys have heard, but it's supposed to snow. Uh, along those lines, you know, it's hard to believe it with a beautiful sunshine and everything like that, but they are giving it out. Somebody looked at me and said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. And that may be the case. It may pass over, but, you know, a lot of people are saying it's going to happen. So it's always best to prepare for such things. In fact, Mike Kemp uh, just shared with me that they're putting together an emergency response task force, as it were, people that he knows and he is involved with that are volunteering. They have, they have four-wheel drives. They have means to be able to go across the ice and everything. Uh, if there is anybody here or in your sphere of influence that needs help during this time. Maybe you got to go somewhere. you got to go to the doctor. Something bad has happened. Let's God forbid that happened, but you need to get out. And you can't. If you're like me, I'm stuck. You know, if I, I can't drive on ice. You know, that's not a good thing. You don't want me to drive on ice. Uh, but you say, hey, i got to get out, i got to go. Well, you get in touch with Mike, and, uh, and they, will, they will get somebody to your help. You, and maybe you are a person who gives help. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, you know, you're something of that nature, and you can't get out, and you've got to be there. You holler at them. They, they're willing to give you a ride to your workplace. Uh, maybe you need some food. If you hadn't already got food, <laughs> there ain't no bread anyway left. Uh, but if you're something that you absolutely, you got to have it, and you're stuck, well, holler at them. And if there's any way that they can help, they certainly will. So that is available. So uh, all of us deacons and elders, you'll, you'll be aware of that, so that if anybody does contact you, you have some resource to send them to. We're going to begin a, a, new, a series of about four lessons. Uh, it, the idea is parenting. And that is a very crucial uh, truth. We, we need to be more involved and more aware of the best way to be the best parent that we can possibly be and some, some things that we can learn from the Holy Bible about parenting and the principles found in the Bible about parenting. But it's really all about the children, amen? It's about the children. I want to be a good parent because of my children. And I know you want to be a good parent if you have children, because of your children. So the title that we've given this series is The Children, focusing on principles of parenting. But it's really about the children. In fact, look in your uh, handout. If you've got a handout, there's an insert in your handout, and that insert is going to outline the next uh, series of lessons. Today, the first one, it says the children, is regard. That's the name of this lesson. We regard our children. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The next lesson is responsibility. What is the responsibility? Who has the responsibility when it comes to our children and, and their success in walk of God? And then on the back side, you have rule. There are some principles about uh, what to teach and how to teach and that sort of thing. And then the final lesson is going to be the results. If we uh, use God's principles, that we, and you see there's, it's chock full of Scripture reference because, folks, I don't know how to tell you how to be a good parent. I don't know all the principles of parenting, but God does. God does, and here are Scriptures that we're going to be examining and looking at, some briefly, some, not, some a little bit more in depth, but we're going to look at these Scriptures under each one of these titles to help to see what God says about parenting. Parenting, And the last one is, of course, the results. The results of applying these principles that God tells us for our children being good parents. Also, out there in the uh, foyer on two or three different tables is a bookmark. There's a bookmark, and it has the same set of scriptures. It has the same 
titles. It starts with the children, and of course there's regard, responsibility, rule, and results, and all the scriptures are there for you. We're going to be looking at Pretty much as we go through, I think we're going to hit all of them. We might even throw in a, a one or two more but because um, we're still working on developing all these and learning and, and to make it a good experience for all of us. So it's very important. So get that bookmark. This is yours. Get it. Uh, uh, get extra. Uh, we're gonna, we have extra. We make more extra. I think we have some more in the wings that are coming out. And pass them out. Give them to your friends and your neighbors and let them have it. And they can cross-reference these. Look these scriptures up. And if you look a scripture up underneath one of these headings, it should come to you about how that scripture fits into that heading. I hope it does. At least that's my intention of breaking it down like this so it will be easier to understand and easier to, to apply. Folks, we love the children. It's all about the children. We've got to regard our children. That's what I named this. We've got four R words, one R word for each lesson. So I chose the word regard because when you regard something, you think dearly of it. You, you love at that. The children, we should regard them. Because here are some sad statistical facts. Only 1%. Now, this comes from uh, the Barna Group. Now, the Barna Group is a leading research organization. And it's focused. The Barna Group's focus. You look it up on the YouTube and the Google or whatever. The Barna Group's focus is on the relationship of faith and culture. So they said, okay, here's our culture. And what's the relationship with that culture with faith? So they did a research on this. And what they found out, that not every child who starts out in church will actually stay in church as time goes on. Many young people are falling away from the faith, they said. They're walking away from church as they grow older. And here's their statistics. Only 1% of young adults... Now that's young adults, maybe in their 30s, maybe hitting 40, that's maybe young adults. Only 1% has what they call a Christian or biblical worldview. Now what is a biblical worldview? A biblical worldview is when you look at the world with certain ideas already in your mind. You know, there's a worldview over in China. They have certain worldview. They view the world in a certain way because of their culture. We Americans view the world a certain way because of our culture. Well, only 1% of young adults in America view the world with a biblical worldview. Biblical worldview meaning there is a God. And that God sent His only begotten Son to planet Earth to die for the sins of the world. And that... He is now at the right hand of Father, and He will come back again one day. He will judge the world, and you go to heaven or hell. Those are some biblical principles that they looked at, and they said, Do you believe that, young people, young adults? Do you believe that? Only 1% said, I have that worldview. Others say, No, I, don't, I really don't see it that way. I go to church, and I belong to a certain uh, Christian group, Eh, but I don't believe the Bible is really inspired by God. You know, those miracle things that Jesus uh, did, ah, that's not, it really wasn't a miracle. It was just a good story that Matthew, Martin, Luke, and John put together to help teach us uh, good principles. So they don't have a biblical worldview. Because to have a biblical worldview, you believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, every word of it. So, the horrible part about it, that's horrible enough. One out of every, you know, hundred people out there that you go up on the street in New York and say, do you believe that the Bible is true? Only 1% of them say, yeah, I, I see that. I believe that. Only half a percent that are 18 to 23 years old have that biblical worldview. 1% of the young adults. But from 18 to 23 year old, if you walk up to an 18 to 23 year old and say, do you believe such and such and, and give them this biblical worldview idea, 
only half a percent will say, yeah, I, I really do believe that. That's hard for us here in, in Dennis, Belmont, Tishomingo County to, uh, to understand that because we, have, we believe we have a higher percentage, but do we? What if we were to walk out on the streets of Belmont and just pick an 18, 19, 21-year-old uh, and just ask them some, some questions about a biblical worldview? What would they tell us? Would it reflect maybe this? In fact, here's what the Barner Group found out. 75% of, of young people who are raised, quote-unquote, in the church, or that means exposed to Christianity, affiliated with a church, and I use the word Christianity generically, 75% of them will leave the church that they have been affiliated with after they graduate high school. When they go out into college, when they go get a job, whatever they do, they, church is not that important, and they will quit church. And that's just the facts. Here's another statistic, fact. Church affiliation. They were asked, okay, are you affiliated with a church? Do you say that you belong to a church? The Barna Group and USA Today did this work, and they found that 75% of Christians fall away, and then when they did this research, do you belong to a church, in 1999, 70% of people said, well, I do belong to a church. Now, that doesn't mean that they go. That doesn't mean they attend. Maybe they attend once a year at Christmas or, or Christmas twice a year, Christmas and Easter. Uh, but they, they consider that they are affiliated with the church. 70% of the people that answered that said, yeah, I'm, I'm affiliated with the church. Even though 1% don't have a biblical worldview, they still feel like they're affiliated to a church. In 2019... 65% said, yeah, I'm affiliated with the church, so that's not so bad. You know, we dropped 5%, but bad enough. But in 2020, a year later, 47% said, no, I don't belong to church. What are you affiliated with? None. And here's what they did. Between 2019 and 2020, in that year, the next poll that they put out, they added a box. And in this box, they said, none. That's an option. Before that, there was no option. Are you filling with the church? Are you filling with the Christian church? Are you filling with the Catholic church? Are you filling with this? And then you could mark these boxes, and 70% said, yeah, I'm, I'm that. Yeah, I'm that. But when they were given the choice, none. They said, well, okay, yeah, I'm not affiliated with it, so they, they marked none. 47% of the folks in America marked that box. I'm not affiliated with any church. In 2022, the Pew Research Center projected something. They, they look at facts, and here's what the trend is, and here's what they project. People who identify themselves as Christian. Are you a Christian? Yes. Are you a Muslim? Yes. Are you a Hindu? Yes. Are you a Christian? Yes or no. In America, you think most people, and they do, identify themselves as Christian. But because of what's happening, young people are coming out of churches, going into high school, getting it, or after high school, going to college, and getting into the jobs, getting into society, being influenced by so many factors. Less and less of them are staying with it, and they are beginning to say, well, I'm not a Christian. They're actually, now, in 1999 and 2019, they at least said identified as Christian, whether they went to church or not or only went once a year. But they identified as being Christian in their thought process, in their identification process. But because of this trend of people willing to check that box, I'm not affiliated with anything. They're willing to say, I'm not a Christian. They're becoming more and more free with that. And by 2070, which is really not a long time from now, they, if this trend continues, they predict that only 35% of Americans, that's one out of three Americans, will say, I'm a Christian. Folks, that's shocking. That should, that should curl our spine. This nation was built on Christian principles, amen? It was. And Christianity has been the identifier of this nation for, since its inception. But because of the last few years, something has happened that we're starting to lose young people 
at an alarming rate. And these young people grow up. And when they grow up, they're not saying, I'm a Christian. They're not identifying as worth. They don't even have a biblical worldview. They, don't, they won't even say, I'm a Christian. And that is alarming. They're switching from, I'm a Christian or I'm affiliated with something, to I'm just none. I'm nothing. Here's what a statement that, that the Pew Research Center made when they did this research and projected this fact. It's not a fact yet because it's not happened yet. But according to the trend, this is what's going to happen. One in three people are, are, are going to be Christians in the United States in just a few years. Here's what they said. Revival could happen. There's just nothing in the current data that indicates that it will. That's a profound statement. Revival could happen. A great awakening could take place. But there's just nothing in the data that says that it's going to happen. We're praying that it does. Why? Because we love the children. Amen? We love the children. We love our children here at Liberty Church. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about loving our kids. Now this series, before we move forward, I want to share what this series is not. Pay close attention, especially if you have children in your home right now, or if you've reared children, they're already out of your home and they're living on their own and you have no influence over their spirituality per se. Not saying no influence, but you have very little influence, not like you had when you had them under your wing. This series is not about guilt. This series is not about shame or regret or shoulda, coulda, woulda. You know, these are things when, when you're an adult, you're, you're grown, your kids are grown up, and they've chosen their path. Sometimes you can look back and say, boy, I should have done that. I would have done that. I could have done that. I'm so ashamed of myself because I, I did not practice these principles, or at least it's my perception that I didn't practice the principles. Folks, that's why we talked about memories last week. Memories are actual events that happen, you recall them, but actually they're your perception of that event. They're how that event makes you feel. So you look back and you say, well, uh, that event that I did or did not do, I'm ashamed of it. I feel guilty about that. But that's your perception of that event. The child's perception could be totally different, as we noted. Uh, just the other day, uh, about a month ago, I was asked to keep uh, Jonah for just a little while. Jonah is my four-year-old grandson, and I was asked to keep him. Well, I've got to occupy Jonah. So I go into this place, and this place that I have, it's got tools everywhere. It's just a mess. And in a bucket, I've got some screwdrivers, and they're all mixed up. And I said, well, I'm going to occupy his mine. So I sit him down, and I pull out this bucket, and I said, look here. I want to separate these. These are Phillips screwdrivers. See the tip end of it? It's called a Phillips. And this is flathead, flathead screwdriver. And this is a nut driver, you know. And, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to take them out of this bucket and put the flatheads, Phillips over here. I want you to tell me what they are before you put them on. He said, okay. So we did that and just had a good old time. I was playing match game. Yesterday, was it yesterday? Deborah was keeping Jonah and we're in, she was in that place that I keep those just a mess of tools. And, uh, and he looks and he goes, oh, that's where Papa keeps his tools. She goes, yeah, now this is a month ago now. He looks up and he said, Papa likes to keep his tools straightened. <laughs> My tools ain't straightened. They're in a bucket. <laughs> you know, just dump them in a bucket. But his perception. That was, a, it was an event. It happened. I, I was there. He was there. We did the same thing. But in his perception, Papa likes to keep those, schools straight, those tools straight, you know. So sometimes we look back in our experience, oh, I wish I'd have taught him how to have a Phillips screwdriver. Uh, but in reality, he learned so much. He learned a feeling. He learned emotion. Uh, and I didn't even know he was learning. So a lot of times that's a... So when we feel guilty, 
when we feel ashamed, when we do all this uh, coulda, shoulda, wouldas with our kids who are grown up and doing whatever they're doing and you, don't, you can't fix that, then a lot of that is your feeling. A lot of that is your perception. And this is also not, listen carefully, about faults, fault finding, or shortcomings, or criticisms. You know, if you've got children, you want to do the best you can for your children, and you will. But I promise you this, you will never, never live up to the expectation that you have set for yourself. You're always going to come up short. Because you want your children to do well. You don't want them to be a part of that group that falls away and leaves and says, I'm not even a Christian. I don't even believe in God. You don't want them to fall into that category. So you will do everything you can. But no matter what you do or don't do, you will never live up to the expectation that you have set for yourself. Much less, listen, the expectation that others set for you. Parents get criticized all the time for, listen, letting their kids cry. I didn't let my kids cry. They just cried. <laughs> you don't have to let them cry. They just cry. There's a story. A uh, guy, he's got his child, he's about four, and he's in a grocery store, and the child's in a, 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 the basket, and he's pushing him around in the buggy. And, and that child is screaming to high heaven. And, and, the, and, the, and the daddy's walking the first aisle, and he said, It's okay, Billy. It's okay, Billy. We're going to be out in just a few minutes just picking up a few things. Well, this other guy is watching it happen. Can't let that kid cry, you know. Man. And he just goes to the next aisle, and they pass each other. The kid's still crying, and Billy, it's going to be fine. We're going to be checking out just any minute now. We're going to be back. And the guy follows them around the whole store, and they check out at the same time, and he's telling, and the kid's just still crying. He says, Billy, it's a fine. It's going to be fine, Billy. I'm going to pay the, the, the guy, and I'm going to go out to my car. Everything's going to be fine. When they got out to the car, the guy finally, who is witnessing all this, says, well, you know, that father was pretty good. He's patient with that kid. So he just walks up to the guy. He said, sir, I just want to just, I know it was stressful in there, but I just want to compliment you and and encourage you that you did just a great job encouraging that child while you was through the store. You know, telling him, Billy, it'll be okay. And he goes, oh, no, you misunderstand. I'm Billy. <laughs> we need encouragement. And there's so many people out there that are telling you that, you're not a good parent. You're not doing the right thing. You shouldn't let your kid do this or that or didn't do this. And a lot of that criti criticism comes from people who don't even have kids themselves. Have you noticed that? <laughs> don't even have kids themselves. But they can tell you how to raise your kids and how to make your... And, but here's the worst criticism. The worst criticism that comes is from people who have kids and they have perfect kids. You know those people? Oh, their kids have never done this. They've never done that. And they've never done this other thing. They never even think about doing that. And they love to point their finger at you and say, you shouldn't let your kids do that. Mine didn't. You shouldn't let your kids happen. That. Yeah, mine didn't. You shouldn't let your kids have this. And you shouldn't do this for your kids. I didn't. And all this. And one of two things is true about that. Number one, they're lying their face off. <laughs> Their kids did do that. They just didn't see it, or they refused to acknowledge it, uh, or they didn't let nobody else see it. Uh, their kids weren't that perfect. That's one thing it could be. Or it could be this. It could be that they did a marvelous job parenting. They used godly principles in their home, and they parented well. And those children benefited from that parenting. And they are perfect. I mean, they don't, they don't do bad. They are well-behaved. They are attentive. They are just, they're good kids. But those parents may never have experienced a single-parent home like you're going through. They never have experienced a kid with mental and emotional problems like your kid has. They never experienced the 
poverty that you've experienced, where you, you, you don't even know how you're going to feed your kid tonight. They've never experienced some of these circumstances that you're going through. So my point is this. All of the guilt, all of the shame, all of the regret, all of the fault finding, all of the shortcomings of those parents over there, all of the criticisms, check it at the door. Check it at the door. That's not what this lessons are about. Not what it's intended to be about. The, even God, God made the first man and woman, his children in his own image, Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the cool of the day. What did they do in short order? <laughs> they sinned. They disobeyed God himself. And he was walking with them, talking with them, God himself. And they still messed up and ruined, brought a lot of pain for the whole world. So we come short. And we, there are, there's plenty of shortcomings. There's plenty of fault findings. There's plenty of I wished I could have, should have, would have. There's plenty of that to go around. That's not what this is all about. What this is all about is what can I do now? What, what can I learn from the Word of God that will help me do a better job equipping the children that I love now so that they will benefit from that? We certainly love our children. We love the children. Psalms chapter number 127 verse number 3 says this, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. To have a kid is a blessing. Psalms 103, verse number 13, it's in your handout. Like as a father pities his children, it means he loves his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. Here's what God did. He looked down and he saw how much a father loves his kids and he says, you know, that's how I feel about those that fear me, those that follow me. God actually used the love that a parent has for a child as a instruction tool to show one of his own attributes. That's pretty heavy. You must love your child if God's going to use that as an example of his own attributes. Psalms 127, verses 4 through 5 says, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, and you know how important arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. He needs those arrows. He uses those arrows. He loves those arrows. So as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy, verse number 5, is the man that has his quiver. That's what holds the arrows. Has his quiver full of them. We love our kids. The Bible recognizes that. In Luke chapter number 15, verses number 20 through 24, that's the story of the prodigal son. He just squandered his daddy's blessings and love, and he went away in the far land. He ruined it all. You know the story. Read the story if you don't know the story. In Luke chapter 15, Verses 20 through 24, the prodigal son comes home and instead of the father pointing his finger, shame on you, guilt on you, bad on you, criticize on you. What does the father do? The father sees him coming a great way off and he runs to him and he puts his arms around him and he hugs him and he kisses him. Why? Because the father loves the kids. The parents loves the kids. And when the kid comes home, they begin to be merry. That means they were happy that he was back. Why? Because we have UPR. Write that down in your notes. UPR. What does that stand for? Unconditional. Unconditional. Positive. Regard. Unconditional positive regard is what we have for our kids. Now, we don't agree with everything they do. We certainly are telling them you should not do that. But the father in this story did not agree with that man going out, his son, his son, going out and just, the Bible says it was riotous living. Regardless of what your kid may or may not have done or may not will have done, if you compare it to this prodigal son, I'm sure it wouldn't hold a candle. This guy was horrible, 
And yet when he come home, his father said, I love you anyway. I have unconditional, positive regard for you. I regard your children. We have that for our children. Doesn't mean that we just let our kids do whatever they want to do. The father didn't want that kid to do that. He did it. He couldn't control it. It doesn't mean we let our kids do what we, If we let our kids do whatever they want to do and follow their heart, we know what the problem is with that. The heart is wicked. The heart is deceitful above all things. It'll lie to you. And if you just let their, your kid follow their heart, let them do whatever they want to do, they're going to fail because so will you. So will I. If I follow my heart and do what my heart says, I need discipline. I need education and rules. I need all of these things. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the series. But we still love them anyway. If even if they don't follow in the path that we want them. We love them enough. And we love them enough to give them to God. I want to say that again. We love the kids enough. We regard our kids enough that we're willing to dedicate them to Almighty God. God, they're yours. I can't. No matter how hard I try, no matter how good of parenting, even when I see your word, God, and I put these into my life and I do the best I can, the kid, and we're going to be talking about this next week, but the kid still can go off. I can only do one thing, even while they're young and I'm raising them, I'm rearing them. The only thing that I can do is dedicate those kids to you. Because one thing I know is that God loves the children. Folks, not only do we love our kids, God loves those kids. Mike just read just a moment ago from Matthew 19, verses 13 through 14. He said, let those little kids come to me. They were trying to keep the kids away. No, you let those kids come to me. Let me pray over them. Let me touch them. Let me bless them. Because such is the kingdom of, of heaven. That's how God feels about those kids. So we need to give our kids to God. In Matthew 18, verse number 10, the Bible says this. Take heed, be careful, what? That you despise not one of these little ones. I don't care if they're your kid and you think you can do anything you want to. No, they're God's kids. And you should not despise those kids. Don't do that. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now, I don't know what all that means. You study that on your own. Does every kid have an angel? In this case, is the children the little kids, or is he generalizing it to us? We are the children of God, Christians, and we have special relationship with God. I don't know. Study that for yourself. But here's the general principle. Here's the root of the principle. We need to give our kids to God. Amen? Give our kids to God. He loves them more than we do. He has special fondness for them. He created them. Folks, we have to give our kids to God. There is a story of a lady who was caught in a fire in a building. She was on the second or third store. She was way up there. Falling out of that window would be certain death. And she had a child in her arms. The room that she was in was engulfed with flames. The only way out was through that window. And this child was in her arms, and she was clinging to the child, and she, she loves that child. She, she wants to save that child. She doesn't want that child to die. She would give her life for that child. But even in giving her life, it, the flames would engulf her, and it would engulf the child. She'd lose the child as well. She looked out the window, and she saw down there some emergency response people. And they were hollering up at her, throw your child out the window. Drop your child. Give up your child. Let us catch your child. What she had to make a decision to do is to give that child into the hands of someone that could save them. She could not save that child herself. She let the child go. 
The emergency response people were trained in such things. They caught the child safely. The woman herself got out of the building safely without having to hold the child. She was able to get some movement and get some out. She got out, and they interviewed her. And they said, what was going through your mind at that moment that your child, you know? She said, I had to let him go to save him. Sometimes, and let, and let me say this, all the time, we've got to be willing to let our kid go, dedicate him to God, because God, God loves the children. Put these principles into your home, into your life, for the sake of the child. Give your child to God and trust God to take care of that child, to do what God said he would do because he loves those kids. And folks, he loves the kids more than you do, a lot more than you do. He loves the, he's more capable of loving the kids more than you do, more than I do. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 11, here's what he said. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, because you love them, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? Again, he's talking about you have a quality to love your kids and you want to give good things to them, but let me tell you, I want to use that to show what kind of quality God has to those who love Him, Christians, followers. Here's the point. I have the capacity, God does, to love your kids more than you do. You say, it's not possible. Nobody can love my kid more than I do. God can. John chapter number 3, verse number 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world, and that includes your kids, that He gave His only begotten Son. That's how much He loves you. That's how much He loves your kids. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Don't want them to perish. They have no reason to perish. They should not perish. But they should have everlasting life. That's what I want. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God loves our kids. And we've got to be willing to give our kids to God. How? By following the principles that God has set before us and not letting it be about me. Mistake I've made. About me. You've got to do it the way I think you should be. You need to act the way I feel like you need to act in that grocery store, in that public arena, in that school building in that community. You better follow my rules the way I see it. In other words, you need to be like me. Folks, your kids are not you. They're your seed. There's a lot in them like you, but they're not you. And we'll talk about that in this series. But you've got to give them to God. He loves you. So that means be here as we go through this series. Learn these principles. Apply these principles. Not for you to be a great parent, because you'll never be the kind of parent that you think you ought to be. But it's for your kids. It's for your children. Regard them enough to learn what God says that we can and should do to help them. But perhaps today you are one of those young people. You're one of those young people that after your high school, you went out to college or you got a job and you quit church. You, you're not, you haven't been back to church in months because you're drifting the way the world is influencing you to go. And maybe you don't have this, you're, you do have a biblical worldview because you were raised in church, you were raised at Belmont, you were raised in Tishomingo County and Dennis, but... You're beginning to see other ideas and other thinkings that's taking you further and further away from God. It's time to come back. God loves you too. You need to be baptized for the remission of sins. You got out of church and you have never even been baptized for the remission of sins. You know you should be. You studied that. It's time to do that. Come back home. Have that biblical worldview. 
You say, well, I was baptized when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, but here I am 23. Here I am 35. Here I am 40, whatever you are. And I've been away so long, I haven't even been to church but once this whole month. And I know this is only the second Sunday, but, but all the month in December, I only went to church three times. And I only go on Sunday mornings. Sometimes I might flip in here on Wednesday night for some reason, and we'll talk more about these things as we go through this. But maybe, maybe it's time to embrace God's principles and let God have us too because he loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Why don't you come? Why together we stand and sing?